Welcome to the Mark series, part 38. We're going to be in Mark chapter 10, verses 32 through 34, and like I sometimes do, let me give you guys a quick rundown on everything we're about to do. So we're doing a verse-by-verse study through the Gospel of Mark, but I like to talk about apologetics when the topic comes up, theology, and pastoral type encouragement, living the Christian life. And we're kind of going to do things in that order in this section of Mark where Jesus predicts his own death and resurrection. So the apologetics issue we're going to cover today is this, a historical case, a a historical case, or an historical case, however you want to say it, I think both ways are fine, uh, that Jesus really did predict his own death and resurrection. That's that's the argument I'm going to make. And I'm going to offer real historical, you know, arguments for that. And then we're going to, number two, after a big section on apologetics, we're going to get into some deep theological insights that we should gather as we look at Jesus's words about his death and resurrection. And we'll deal with some of the modern progressivism, Christian progressivism, or I should call it Christian progressivism, because sometimes they abandon important Christian truths in their in their attempt to reinvent Jesus. And we'll talk about some of that and get some theological insights. Then I'm going to give you some pastoral encouragement about our attitude towards our own suffering that I think is appropriate, not just because of whatever's going on today in your life, but because of life. This kind of stuff is going to confront us all the time. We need to have a biblical mentality towards the pain and the suffering we experience. We desperately need that, especially because once we get into the hard times, if we aren't prepared, we're fi- we find that we're less equipped to deal with uh, the very hard stuff of life. So here we go. And uh, if you didn't know this, uh, my name is Mike Winger. I'm a pastor here in Southern California. I do uh, apologetics and theology and try to help people learn how to teach uh, people to learn how to think biblically about everything. If I can learn how to speak clearly, that would also help. And so if you like that kind of thing, you could subscribe, you could follow the content, and hopefully it will just be a blessing to you. Everything I make is free. It's just accessible for you to consider and grow. All right, here we are, Mark chapter 10, verse uh, 32 through 34. We're just going to read these three verses and get them into our minds, and then we'll get into our apologetics section for today's Bible study. So Mark 10, 32, they were on the road going up to Jerusalem. And Jesus was walking on ahead of them. And they were amazed. And those who followed were fearful. And again, he took the twelve aside and began to tell them what was going to happen to him. Saying, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit on him and scourge him and kill him. And three days later, he will rise again. So here's the the question I want to ask as we approach this passage. Did Jesus really predict his own death and resurrection? Now, you may say, Mike, of course he did. Like, that's what the Bible says, and I'm a Bible-believing Christian. Um, But the question I'm going to ask is from a different perspective today. We're going to gather evidence in in a historical fashion for the fact that Jesus really did predict his own death and resurrection. So that's what we're about to do. But before we launch into the historical investigation— and I offer these insights, um, which I didn't make up. I didn't gather. I'm not, I'm not a historian, but I studied historians to try to gather this data for you. But before we launch into it, I want to give you four things you need to know as you read or listen to or consider a historical examination of Jesus. One, first thing, is that historical investigation is limited. And we, we don't realize this often going in. Like uh, those of us who are not experts, we look at experts and we're like, hey, just tell me how it is. Tell me how it is. And we don't realize that sometimes they're dealing with very specialized skill sets that have limitations that are positive and negative. And so you need to know this because they're limited to certain types of tools in their in their attempts to discover the truth about history. And they're limited to certain considerations. Now, these limits may or may not be all good. For instance, one of the limits of most historical research done nowadays is they are blind, intentionally blind, to the inspiration of Scripture. That is, they will examine what the Bible says with the assumption or the treatment that the Bible is not inspired. Now, they may well be historians that are believers and they think the Bible is inspired, but in their examination of the text, they treat it like it's not inspired. Now, that, that could be good or bad, right? Well, I mean, if the Bible's not inspired, then that could help you in your, in your research. If the Bible is inspired, this could actually hurt you in your research. You could be misweighing the various sources you're, you're comparing when you look at history. Um, so this could be good or bad. So the benefit of what I'm doing right now with digging into the historical case for Jesus having predicted his own death and resurrection is that um, it's it's like a way of doing evangelism. It's a way of saying, let me reach others who like 
in the historical method, they're not going to affirm to start with that the scripture is inspired, but perhaps I can build a bridge to the, the uh, predictive ability of Jesus Christ using this um, non-Christian methodology. Not unchristian, anti-Christian, just, it's just blind to those things. So the second thing is that historians, uh, they understand this, I think, but a lot of us laymen don't. A fail to confirm something in history is not a denial that it happened. So to give you an example, I, I don't have a historical proof that there was a guy named Joseph who ate an apple in Jerusalem in AD 32. I don't have like that historical evidence. It is very likely that it happened. I mean, probably it did. Someone named Joseph, you know, did eat an apple in Jerusalem at the time. But I don't have any kind of historical evidence to weigh in on it. So saying that there's zero evidence for it doesn't actually mean it didn't happen. Do you, do you get the drift here? So history is actually better at confirming things that did happen than it is confirming things that didn't happen. So there, that can be a misconception that we that we often have. And the third thing is that his, history is probabilistic by nature. So uh, historians will often, they'll, they'll gather all the arguments for something in history. And they'll say, okay, we've got like say five arguments for this thing, five pieces of evidence weighing in its favor, maybe one, two weighing in against it. So they'll offer a probabilistic analysis of that. They'll say, hey, on a scale, I'll give you an example, on a scale of like one to five, one to seven, or one to nine, these are three different scales I've seen historians use. They, they say from the bottom of the scale, it's like really super unlikely. It almost certainly didn't happen. That's the bottom of the scale. And then the very, very top of the scale is like, it almost certainly happened. But it's, it's always almost. It's never like totally 100% certitude that something took place. Because that's the limits of their scale. And so in the middle, they'll say, oh, it's indeterminate. We have no evidence really for or against, or, or it's equal on both sides. And then uh, you know above and below that, you have percentages. So they might be like 70% sure something happened, 80% sure something happened based upon their examination. Now, don't let this throw you off because this can mess you up in a couple ways. You can think, oh, well, um, maybe maybe a historian only thinks it's like 85% you know, they're sure that Jesus really rose from the dead. <laughs> and actually, that's a really great verdict because of the limits of history. That's actually a very high verdict. We, we, would, uh, we wouldn't want to dog them or bash them in any way because of that. So what we want to know about th the nature of a probabilistic estimation is that you, you should never fault a historical argument that ends with like a 80, 90, 98, 99% probabil probability that something happens. That's not a limit of the evidence even. That's not a limit of, of, of anything other than the method itself. The method itself is limited to probabilistic things. So the, the best thing you're going to get is a, oh, this is very, very likely. This is extremely likely. It's almost sure that it happened. So that's just good to know. Um, his, history is probabilistic by nature. Uh, Mike Lycona, whose work I'm going to lean on for today's video, he uh, he judges this by a nine-point scale of, of you know lowest probability to highest probability. All right. Finally, number four, things you should know doing historical things. Um, scholars are people. Scholars are people, and sometimes they're driven by things other than the evidence. Dare I say, probably a lot of the time, a lot of the time, we're all, we all have bias. I have bias, you have bias, and when we look at scientists or scholars or professionals in some field, we often think that they're unbiased because they have such great information. But it really is often those biases that will change the way they view the information. And, and that's something we should all acknowledge. Like, I'm going to be affected by that. The best I can do is to just be aware of it. That's all we can do. In New Testament studies, this is especially obvious. There's often two sets of standards that people have. They have, for instance, you know, normal historical claims. Here's my set of standards. It's not that hard to prove a normal historical claim. Ah, but if it's a Christian claim, or perhaps it's a miraculous claim, a claim that seems to involve God doing something, then all of a sudden I have this crazy high standard where you, you can never, ever prove a miracle because that's my rule in how I do history. So an example of someone who does this is Bart Ehrman, who I, I pick on because he's he's uh, just so well known and so influential in the world. I, I'm not any, nothing personal against the man, but his influence is there, and so we should talk about it. And and he's especially influential in amongst atheists uh, online. Well, Bart Ehrman is famous for this. I don't know if you realize this, but he he doesn't think that Jesus is the the arguments against you know the resurrection or something like that are so good because of the grounds of those arguments. His, his real reason for rejecting, say, the resurrection of Christ or something is as a historical thing is because he says, as a historian, you're not allowed to posit miracles. You're just not allowed. It's a rule that you simply don't break. 
No matter what the evidence, you can't say it was a miracle. And so in this case, it would affect people when they look at, hey, you know, how likely is it Jesus really predicted his death and resurrection? There are some who would simply disregard all the evidence and say, hey, that would be like a, a, a foreknowledge thing. This would be like a God type thing. So man, we're just going to, we're going to rule that out ahead of time. And the reason is because scholars are people, they're people and they're reading their own biases into it. If you approach this like a normal historical event, I think you're going to say we have good evidence to support it. So what are the results of the historical investigation that we're going to launch into here? Well, Mike Lycona, uh, he published a peer-reviewed article in the Journal for the Study of the Historical Jesus. This was in 2010. And the title of the article is, Did Jesus Predict His Death and Vindication Slash Resurrection? He says, in summary, there is surprisingly a preponderance of evidence in favor of the historicity of these predictions. And we're going to go through now. He offers six arguments. I'm going to give you five arguments, five, five arguments for the actual prediction coming off the lips of Jesus of his death and resurrection. Then we'll deal with three arguments against it and respond to those, which also he does in his article um, as well. He also does this uh, in a shorter form in his book on the uh, the the. The Resurrection of Jesus, a Historiographical Approach. Okay, so here we go. First argument. First argument for historicity. And what you need to do is gather all these arguments and see the weight of them all. And if you're a skeptic and you're like, did Jesus really predict that? I hope you'll you'll consider the following. So the first is this. The first argument goes like this. The predictions of Jesus, like what we just read here in Mark 10, they're very early. The content of what Jesus says in not just Mark 10, but in a number of other places we read about in the, in the New Testament, and these are different sources, we'll get to that in a second, these seem to be very early accounts. They don't reflect later traditions, they don't reflect some later thinking, they, they come back to the lips of Jesus because they're so early. So one of the ways you can see this is in Matthew 16, I'll take you there right now. Matthew 16 verse 17 through 23. And this passage has what's called Semiticisms or sayings that don't come from Greek, but clearly seem to be coming from a, a Hebrew or Aramaic, really, original statement, which would put it, you know, back, not into the, the Greek experience of the church, but back into the words of Jesus originally. So Jesus says, Simon Bar-Jonah, which is Simon, son of Jonah. That's, that's uh, you know, an Aramaic thing. He says, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. That, that phrase, flesh and blood, that's, that may well be a Semiticism, or it seems to be. The, um, the phrase when he says, Hades will not overpower it, that phrase also, will not overpower, goes back to a Semitic connection. And this continues all the way through verse 23, these kinds of things. Dr. Hans Beyer says this, these suggest pre mathian tradition with strong Palestinian Jewish Christian roots, independent of, of Mark, independent of Matthew. These are independent things. And so this becomes a significant piece of evidence that we have these Semiticisms that, that are evident in the text. Now, keep in mind, what I'm doing right now is I'm saying that even amongst scholars who are willing to chop the New Testament into pieces to say Jesus did say that, Jesus didn't say that, they're still going to grant that we have good independent reason for thinking that at least the predictions of Jesus' uh, death and resurrection were really his. In Mark 9.31, we also have the same kind of thing. Mark 9.31, one of his predictions, Jesus says, The Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him. And when he's been killed, he will rise three days later. So this phrase, the Son of Man, is to be delivered into the hands of men. When you get it back to the Aramaic, the likely Aramaic original, it has what's called a paranomasia. And what's a paranomasia? Well, this is this is a fancy way that a scholar wants to say a pun. It's just a pun. And the pun is the Son of Man is to be, in the Aramaic, would be handed into the hands of men. So that's kind of how it would be phrased in the Aramaic. So when you get that, you're like, wow, this this really has an original statement that came from another language. It's, it's not coming uh, just from Mark. Jesus' Last Supper teaching is also significant. I, I won't go to it for the sake of time here, but in Luke 22, verses 15 through 20, we have the Last Supper where Jesus is talking about his body is broken for, for them, like those types of things. This is my blood, the blood of the new covenant. So he's speaking um, about his death. This is another prediction passage. I don't know if you realized how many were actually in the Bible. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 24 through 25, we also have a Last Supper account that comes from Paul. And so we have these different accounts coming from different people 
And if for those skeptics who are like, but that's the Bible, you can't believe the Bible. I'm going to come back to you in a second. Well, in about 10 minutes, 15 minutes, I'll come back to you and I'll address that issue. I want you just to soak in these various sources and in the information I'm giving you now. So this is like actually old info. Um, in 1 Corinthians, I mean, this is this is arguably written before Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. And we are we have here another account of a prediction from Jesus related to his death and resurrection. You know, Paul, in other words, he, he's not making this stuff up. And now some might say, well, Paul, maybe he did. Maybe Paul just invented this, this saying about Jesus dying and rising and the whole Last Supper thing. But we actually have an argument against that as well. In 1 Corinthians 7, Paul is dealing with a marriage issue, a marriage discussion in the church. And he's answering questions that the, that the Corinthians had asked him. So he's, you know, as you go through 1 Corinthians, answering all these questions they were asking. Well, one of the questions is about marriage and should people be single? Should they, should they get divorced for the value of singleness for the kingdom? Like, what do we do? At any rate, Paul wants to give them guidance and direction about an issue of marriage. And he says in there about one particular issue, I have no command from the Lord, but here's my instruction to you. And so he makes a distinction between Jesus's commands and his. Now, earlier he, he mentions Jesus said this, you know, wife, don't separate from your husband, husband, don't separate from your wife. But then he goes on and he talks about the trouble of a believer and an unbeliever and all that. And he makes a secondary judgment call because it's a new issue that Jesus didn't specifically address. Here's the point. Paul didn't think it was okay to put words on Jesus's lips and pretend that Jesus said them. He openly admits, yeah, I don't have a command from Jesus on that. Here's my best judgment. Okay. So that means Paul is not inclined to invent words of Jesus. And he records a prediction. There's an independent account of the Last Supper uh, and Jesus's prediction in Mark 14, 22 through 24. And this all supports the authenticity of Jesus's predictions. And it actually lends support to him understanding it as a sacrifice for other people's sins. That's pretty profound as a historical thing goes. That was number one. So, let me, so it's very early. We have reason to think it's very early. It's also multiply attested. I've kind of hinted at this already, but I want to highlight it here. In the Gospel of Mark, we have a number of different times where Jesus has these sayings, and we have indications even in some of those locations that these are these date back to that early account. So they're multiple in Mark. In Matthew, we have it as well, but Matthew and Luke are independent of each other in this case. Matthew and Luke. Matthew 16, 21 through 23, and Luke 9, uh, 22. They're not copying each other. There, it's written differently, showing independence, not dependency. Matthew's Semiticisms, also the unique elements of Matthew that are Semitic that I showed you earlier, those are independent of Mark. He's not getting that from Mark. He's getting it from somewhere else, which pushes back to an early and multiply uh, attested thing. We also see that Jesus' knowledge of his fate in his prayer is evident. So Jesus, as he's praying in the garden, when he's agonizing and he's praying, he's agonizing because he knows he's going to die. Now, this is in Mark 14, Matthew 26, and Luke 22. So it's multiply attested and independent. Um, Mike Lycona, actually, in his survey of this topic, he gave nine independent examples, nine independent examples from Mark, uh, M, L, and John. What do, why do I, what do I mean by M, L, and John? Let me tell you what I mean by M, L, and John. Okay, so Mark, we know that's the book of Mark. Um, M is not just the gospel of Matthew. M is what scholars use to refer to content that's in Matthew that is not also in Luke, right? It's not in Luke, it's not in Mark, it's just in Matthew. L refers to content in Luke that's not in Mark and not in Matthew. So it's unique. And of course, John is the one that's not synoptic. So it's not in those ones either. So when you look at just the unique info, Mark, M, L, and John, there's actually over 19 passages in question that bring us this multiple attestation of Jesus's prediction of his death and resurrection. That's a lot. Now, to put this in context, historians, when they see two sources, two, they think they've hit historical pay dirt and they have a really good confirmation of a historical event. Here we have a number of independent sources. This is a pretty significant argument here in favor <clears throat> of Jesus having actually predicted his own death and resurrection. Number three, the predictions of Jesus's death and resurrection fill the criterion of embarrassment. The criterion <clears throat> of embarrassment. And of all the of all the historical things online that, that I've heard atheists engage on, this is the one that they really dislike the most, is the criterion of, of embarrassment. It's the most common sense criterion in the world, and they want to sometimes act like it doesn't exist. But it goes like this. You're not likely to make stuff up when it embarrasses you, right? We're just saying it's not as likely. If I tell you a story about how when I was in elementary school, I 
peed my pants and my grandmother had to come over and bring me new pants and I got all embarrassed, you're more likely to believe that story than not. I mean, that did, that did actually happen to me. I'm just being real with you. But it was, it was totally somebody else's fault. Um, but, but this is an embarrassing story. You're much more inclined to believe embarrassing stories than you are stories that make me look great. If I told you I was the quarterback of the football team and I helped us win the state championship, you may be a little less inclined to immediately believe that story, especially if you look at me. <laughs> I'm not a quarterback. Um, so yeah, that's, I think, an understandable thing. Well, in the Gospels, we have accounts of Jesus giving these predictions in very embarrassing situations. Not just embarrassing for Jesus. No, embarrassing for the people who are writing them down later. The people who supposedly would have made them up if they're not really historical. Why would they be making up embarrassing elements? So I'll give you examples. Uh, in Mark 8, 27 through 33, we've gone over this passage in the series already, but in this passage, Peter rebukes Jesus about the very fact that he says he'll die and rise again. So Peter's like, hey, you're the Messiah. Jesus goes, yep, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. And then he, he says, I'm going to die and rise again. And Peter's like, no, Lord, no way. I, absolutely not. Jesus then rebukes Peter. This is embarrassing for two reasons, right? Peter, the, the early church is not going to make up, fabricate. They're not likely to fabricate embarrassing things about Jesus that his disciples rebuking him or about Peter that, that he's being called Satan by Jesus. Yet if you take away the prediction of Jesus' death and resurrection, the embarrassing part about the rebukes, it doesn't even make sense. There is no place for the embarrassing part without the historicity of the predictions. That's very significant. This is also in Mark 10, 33, Matthew 16, verses 21 through 24. Jesus' prayer in the garden is also considered embarrassing. So we have the embarrassment criteria in multiple places. In Mark 14, Matthew 26, and Luke 22, Jesus is portrayed as wrestling with the fate that he's about to experience. Even some Christians feel uncomfortable when they see how much Jesus is agonizing about what he's about to suffer. Remember Luke, he's sweating great drops of blood. This is a very agonizing, he even says, if it's possible, let this cut pass from me. This is a very significant and very actually embarrassing thing. Now, I don't think this is, we should be em, em, uh, embarrassed in the sense of our theology. This is actually what God did with this passage is perfect. It's just right, but it's just not the kind of thing the church would invent, right? This is something that actually happened that God actually did and gave us for good reason, but we wouldn't make this up. This is actually totally against the trend of martyrdom stories. When martyrdom stories are being fabricated or expanded upon, changed over time, we always see the martyrs getting bold and strong and they're unafraid and they just move forward without any agony. And we, uh, we, we don't think that we have this with this story of Jesus in the garden. Now, take away him, his knowledge of his death, his prediction of what's about to come, and his agony in the garden doesn't make sense. So there's another reason. Number four, fourth argument for the histor historicity of these claims. There's uh, just a lack of theologizing, a lack of theologizing. If later Christians invented the predictions of Jesus, we would expect to see more, more heavy-handed additions of the meaning of what it all was about, right? It, 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 there's some subtleness that's in there that we can, we can get at, but it's really vague and not as not nearly as obvious as you'd expect if you had Christians inventing and pretending to put on the lips of Jesus. And so we could look at an example of this, uh, Josephus, right? When Josephus writes about Jesus, he's a first century historian. There's like a real historical core where he wrote about Jesus and about that, that some thought he was the Messiah. And there's some nice things for the Christians that he wrote in there. But it seems that later Christians, some added to that. And they said, he was the Messiah, if it's even fair to call him a man. And they, they like made it better. And that's, that's a sign that we don't see in the predictions of Jesus. So this is, this is you know, in, let, me, let me make it more clear. In the strongest passages, in the multiply attested, embarrassing early passages that even have the criterion of dissimilarity, which we won't get into, there is in those best historical sources we've got in the New Testament, we have little reflection on the significance of Jesus's death in those exact passages such as him atoning for sin, that kind of thing. So lack of theologizing, number four. Number five, fifth argument, and you put all these together to get your historical case. Many of the predictions, and this is my favorite one, uh, are son of man statements. So I remember reading lo long ago that that when when Jesus calls himself the son of man, it's, it's kind of like a only Jesus did that sort of thing. 
it's very rare for anyone other than Jesus to call himself or call Jesus the son of man. That just doesn't really happen. But Jesus does it all the time. It's like his favorite title for himself. He's the son of man. And I think there's prophetic reasons, uh, theological reasons why he does that. But the later Christian church just didn't refer to him as the son of man. It almost never happens in the Bible even. It's very rare. And afterwards, after later in the first century, in the second century, like all this other time, they just stop. They don't call him the son of man unless they're usually quoting a passage in which case Jesus called himself that. Lycona says that the phrase son of man appears on Jesus's lips in every gospel layer in multiple literary forms. And so generally speaking, scholars generally speaking are going to say that when you see Jesus say son of man, it's more likely that that's a real saying of Jesus. Keep in mind, these are the same ones who are going to chop the Bible into pieces and say they, they historically approve of one saying and they reject another. They think the phrase son of man makes it more likely that Jesus really said that. And so Jesus saying son of man, and I'll show you the passage again, Mark 10, 31, or 9, 31. I, well, there's one of them. I'll give you in Mark 9, 31, the son of man is to be delivered into the hands of men. There, so it's early. It's also got the son of man statement. Also, we get it in Mark 8, 31. In Mark 8, 31, he began to teach them that the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Then we get it again in Mark 10, 33. Behold, we're going up to Jerusalem and the son of man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes and they will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles that will mock him and spit on him and scourge him and kill him. And three days later, he will rise again. Now, in response to this, the scholar Raymond Brown, who's actually a Catholic scholar, um, he's passed away now, but he was, he was, yeah, I say he's a Catholic scholar, but actually he was not like a conservative Catholic. He thought that they should like rethink the virgin birth, the virgin birth was wrong. Like the reason why I quote him is partially because he's not this like careful conservative scholar. Sometimes it helps when you, when you can, can gather these kinds of quotes from those who you would vehemently disagree with on other areas. And so he says the following about this son of man title. Why was this title so massively retrojected, being placed on Jesus' lips on a scale far outdistancing the retrojection of the Messiah, the Son of God, and the Lord? And if this title was first fashioned by the early church, why has it left almost no traces in non-gospel New Testament literature? Something not true of the other titles. His whole point here is like even a, a scholar who's willing to <laughs> cut chunks out of your scripture, he's like, hey... Saying that the Son of Man stuff does, isn't original, it doesn't make any sense. It just doesn't fit the evidence. So scholars, like I said, they really do see the phrase Son of Man as a mark of authenticity, even those who reject many other aspects of the gospel. So I've given you guys five arguments about it being multiply attested very early, the, the Son of Man statements, the various reasons to think that Jesus really did predict his own death and resurrection. But now, what some of you are going to be very interested in is the arguments against the historicity of these claims. So these come, and all these arguments ultimately are coming from Mike Lycona and his article that I mentioned earlier. He mentions these arguments against as well. So the, the first argument against believing Jesus predicted his death and resurrection is that Jesus' death and resurrection prediction involves the supernatural. And that's the whole argument. Now, to some, I, I think we could split, well, immediately my audience will be split into two groups of people. Some who think that's utterly ridiculous and some who think it's so obvious, how could anyone deny it? Those who think it's ridiculous say, you're just saying I don't want to believe things I don't want to believe. And so you reject the supernatural or the out of the, out of the norm, the, the fact that Jesus could predict something, you know, his death and resurrection, something that seems to be miraculous. Uh, now, there's another way of doing this, though. So some say, you know, I reject it because it's it's supernatural and I reject all supernatural claims. Um, I, I create a standard that's obnoxiously high for anything supernatural so that even though I would normally believe other things with that much evidence, I won't believe your thing because I consider that supernatural. Uh, that's called special pleading and it's a way to keep yourself closed minded is in the in. In reality, but there's a second way of doing this, and that is you don't actually reject the the um, the truth of the supernatural thing. You don't reject that Jesus actually predicted his own death, but you do it. And this is more Bart Ehrman's technique. You say, "Hey, even if he did predict it, we have rules in history where you're not allowed to conclude supernatural things." Hey, maybe he predicted it, maybe he didn't. I'm not allowed to say that because I'm a historian. So as a historian, you can't say that. But this is effectively saying that. 
no matter the evidence, I will never affirm that that thing actually happened historically. So this is this is a way of keeping your mind closed on the issue. So that, that would be a, a fruitless argument, uh, even though it's probably the number one reason why people would reject it. Number two, some would say, I reject Jesus predicting his death and resurrection because it was a later invention by Christians who were trying to exalt Jesus to support his deity. They wanted to make Jesus look bigger and better and badder, so they invented these things. Now, notice this. There's no evidence brought in support of this. And certainly no significant evidence, no real compelling evidence brought in support of this. It's a story. And some people will respond to evidence with storytelling. And that's what you're getting here. But this is an assumption. It's not an argument. Now, this is how it happens in scholarship sometimes, though. They'll, they'll just, with a sentence, they'll just write off. And, and I'll admit, like as I've been reading, especially the past few years, more and more scholars on different issues, I at one in one case, I love scholarship because I get access to this information that I would have otherwise had a hard time finding. And another side of it, I, I just, sometimes I scratch my head at the obvious humanity of these guys. That they're just being driven sometimes by things that aren't reasonable. And I could be too, I could be too, but I didn't expect it as much when I first started digging into that stuff from the scholars. Now they're just humans. So against that, how do I argue against the idea that they are just exalting Jesus? Well, how about the embarrassment? I mean, if the purpose is to exalt Jesus, why does it occur in passages that are embarrassing for the early church? Where the early church who wants to exalt Jesus wouldn't make that up? Or how is it multiply attested? And how is it early? Why does it lack the theologizing? Why does it have the son of man statements? In other words, all the five points I mentioned before are actual arguments against that view. And that view doesn't have any real significant support. The third argument against Jesus predicting his death and resurrection is that Jesus' followers didn't expect him to rise. Therefore, he must not have really predicted it. This is a strange um, response in my view. But they're saying, hey, the apostles weren't expecting Jesus to come back. They didn't think he was going to rise again. And so he must not have predicted it. Here's my response to that one. Um, first off, there's, and I guess the whole point is this, there's other explanations than they made it up. And those other explanations make more sense with the, the multiple attestation and the early, earliness of the early attestation of the, uh, the, the claims you know, that Jesus did predict it, plus the Semiticisms, plus the lack of theologizing, son of man, all that kind of thing. Um, but also, in the New Testament, right in our very source texts, we see that the church, the, excuse me, the early Jews, the first century Jews, had a lot of false expectations of the Messiah. They were not just basing it off of what the Old Testament said. They had, you know, grown to have common thinking about what the Messiah was going to do. And they never thought he was going to die. In fact, historically, when a guy who they thought might be the Messiah, because there were others, when that guy died, the movement died with him. And they just assumed, okay, he must not be the Messiah. In fact, this is one of the chief arguments that modern Jews bring against Jesus being the Messiah was that he died. Because there still is that expectation that's stubborn and hard to break that the Messiah won't die. That is a common concept. G Jesus, when he told Peter that he was going to die, Peter says it will never be. And so the New Testament doesn't reflect the disciples never expecting him to die because he never predicted it but never expecting it because they had other assumptions that were really driving their thinking. And that, I think, is the answer to the question. Other times, they consider symbolic meanings to Jesus' hard sayings. Uh, in some cases, there are symbolic meanings to Jesus' hard sayings. Uh, John chapter 6. But they, they don't understand, ultimately, that Jesus is quite literally, quite seriously going to do exactly that against their prior expectations. We'll talk next week about how Jesus is constantly confronting the false expectations that they have. I'm going to do a survey of, of, of Mark, a quick one, and we'll deal with that as well uh, as some other stuff. We also forget the humanity of the disciples. When, when we say, well, they didn't expect him to rise, so he must not have predicted it. But sometimes we just forget that these people are humans. Peter, right? Peter denied Christ. Why? Because he sees him being murdered and butchered right before his very eyes. Imagine someone you love, you look up to, that you think is a spiritual leader. You have these wonderful expectations of them. You've seen miracles. You, you think you put, you're all in. You're all in for this thing. And then he dies. And in your mind, that means this whole thing was false. I was wrong. He was wrong. I was deceived, maybe. Like, I don't know what was going on. They're, but they're despondent. They're totally down. They watched the murder of someone they loved. And it's just understandable 
on a human level that they just were overwhelmed and walked away. It's not good. It's, it wasn't the right thing to do. And I, we, we would hope we wouldn't do the same thing, but most of us in their shoes probably would have done exactly what they did. So they watched their beloved leader murdered, rejected by the very courts of the Jews that they thought would have been heralding him. And so I think that this is a better explanation for why they didn't expect him to rise. I think it's a much better explanation than thinking that Jesus didn't predict it, especially when you have all those other pieces of evidence. This seems to me like a very high probability case, very strong historical case for Jesus pred predicting his death and resurrection. Uh, Mike Lycona summarizes it this way. He says, the sum of the data suggests that the historical Jesus predicted his violent death and subsequent imminent vindication slash resurrection. The sum of the data, yeah, the, the strongly in favor of Jesus actually truly predicting his death and resurrection. Now, that is just one tiny little fact about the, about the historicity of Christ. One tiny little piece taken with the blinders of the historian and going through the data without the assumption of the inerrancy of, of Scripture or the, the whole truthfulness of Christianity. But when you do this with other pieces of the Christian faith that are central, like the death and resurrection of Christ, you find there is this massive historical case for the truthfulness of Christianity. Even on something like random, like Jesus predicting his death and resurrection. That, to me, is very profound. Uh, very profound. However, a lot of people are not going to give any of the three arguments that I gave against it. They're simply going to say, well, I don't really want to think about it. So I'm just going to say, uh, the Bible says it. I don't believe it. That settles it. And that actually is, let's be honest, that is the level of thinking and the level of reasoning and the level of dialogue that we often see in the online community. The Bible says it. I don't believe it. That settles it. That's the, that's the theme of atheism and the theme of a lot of the agnosticism, skepticism that we see. Not all of it, not by any means, but a significant portion. And that's, I think, part of the response. And, that, and I'll get comments in this video like, why waste your time doing all Mike's trying to jump through hoops and do all this gymnastics to get to his thing. And in reality, um, they're just they won't think long enough. There's a meme level atheism and that rules the day in the online world where you never get deeper in thinking than the memes. Anyway, no religion. No religion has the kinds of historical validation that Christianity has. And even when you approach it with the blinders of history on, it affirms the truth of Jesus Christ. To reimagine Jesus, to do a historical survey of Jesus, and to seriously, soberly try to put together a version of Jesus that is other than what we just read about in the New Testament, the Son of God who died and rose again for, for you, to, to see him as something else, it really requires, there's the gymnastics. Those who, in the even in the 90s, like the, the, the whole attempt to reconstruct the historical Jesus where they would chop the Bible up and they would kind of come up with different versions of Jesus, each scholar kind of inventing their own. It only became more and more apparent that Jesus is a, is a, is a real person as he's presented in the text. And that's where your historical investigation ought to lead ultimately. The central claims about the person, the death, and the resurrection of Christ, those remain true, even if you are willing to chop up Jesus, um, which pushes you back to the truth of Christianity. Uh, but even for those who do chop it up, I think that's also unwise. All right, so we're going to move on past the apologetic section into the theology stuff today. So Mark 10.32, let's read it one more time, and we're going to dig into some theological insights. They were on the road going up toward Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking on ahead of them. Remember that. And they were amazed. And those who, were followed, those who followed were fearful. And again, he took the twelve aside and began to tell them what was going to happen to him. Saying, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes. And they will condemn him to death. And will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit on him and scourge him and kill him. And three days later, he will rise again. So what are some theological insights? Um, I asked you to notice that they were on the road uh, going up to Jerusalem and Jesus was walking ahead of them. Well, notice the two things there. First, Jerusalem's the, des the destination. This is like the only visit to Jerusalem that Mark talks about. It doesn't mean it's the only one that happened. I don't think that anyone was supposed to read the Gospel of Mark and think um, that the only things that happened in Jesus' years of ministry was what was written in his text, right? These are highlighted for specific purposes. But the, there's only one trip to Jerusalem in the Gospel of Mark. And I think because Mark wants to have this real stark moment where it's like, here's Jerusalem. Here comes the cross. And we're, we're meant to really focus on this issue. It's the importance of Jesus being the sacrifice for our sins. That's our theological insight there. 
We also get in verse 32 that Jesus was walking on ahead of them. That's the thing I pointed out. This is actually in itself a neat picture of salvation. Jesus goes first, marching toward death, a death he didn't have to die, to pay for our sins. And where's the disciples? They're behind him, following along. And that is our job too. Every time, well, frequently, when Jesus talks about the cross that he's going to bear, he then mentions some suffering that we will also endure because he wants us to follow his lead in dying to this world, to ourselves, in loving others and forgiving. And so, yeah, this is a beautiful picture. Jesus walking on ahead to, to the death sentence and us following behind. Wow. Okay, then we have two groups. <clears throat> then we have two groups of people. One of them is amazed and the other one's fearful. And that is in verse 12 as well. It says, uh, they, uh, they were amazed and then those who followed were fearful. I think that the they who were amazed is referring to the disciples. Right? Jesus walks on ahead of them. And usually when there's a generic they and they're traveling, we're talking about the disciples in the gospel. But those who followed were fearful just refers probably to a general crowd who happens to be following Jesus at that time. So the question is, okay, why were the disciples amazed? Now, a lot of commentators will say it's because of the prediction. They're amazed and then the rest are fearful because Jesus predicts he's going to die and rise again. But that's not what I read in Mark, right? They're amazed and fearful before the prediction comes. So I don't think we should make that conclusion. Instead, it seems to me that it's a general commentary on the ministry of Jesus. The disciples are amazed. That's a general statement about their attitude towards Jesus. They're just amazed. Like he's, he, he's, we've seen him in Mark. He's healed. He's cast out demons. He's taught with authority. He's done all these great things. He's, he's even done special miracles just that some of the disciples saw and even others didn't like the Mount of Transfiguration. So these are pretty profound things. You know, he raises a dead woman, a dead uh, young lady and then tells people, yeah, don't tell anybody. I mean, they're amazed. They're just blown away by Jesus. But the crowd is fearful. They're different. They have a different attitude. The crowd is fearful. And that just made me scratch my head. Why are they fearful? Why is the crowd scared? If Jesus hasn't predicted his death and resurrection yet, and even when he does, they don't seem to take it very seriously or at least think maybe he's, maybe he's symbolic or mm, maybe he'll explain that later. Maybe it's a parable. So why are they scared? Um, so here's my theory. I'll throw this at you. We don't read anything specific in Mark about why this crowd is following Jesus. But we do know one thing. He's on his way to Jerusalem for a specific purpose, Passover. And it just so happens that in Israel, during Passover, everyone goes to Jerusalem. Jerusalem becomes the most populated city in the nation because everyone travels from around the nation to go to Jerusalem because Passover is where you celebrate, uh, is, is celebrated at Jerusalem. This means that a lot of the crowd may have been following Jesus out of convenience or coincidence. So here they are, they're walking on their way to Jerusalem and they're like, hey, that's Jesus. Jesus is up there. And so this to me explains why they're fearful because they understand the tension. They know that the leaders in Israel, in Jerusalem in particular, are coming against Jesus, even plotting to kill him. This may be an, a known thing, a kind of rumbling around. They've tried to devalue him. They've tried to deride him in public and probably spread it throughout the, the various synagogues that Jesus is not to be trusted and not to be respected. And so we, we know those things. And then finally, they're seeing Jesus going to Jerusalem. And so they may be anticipating more trouble ahead than even the disciples do, who may have these expectations of Jesus coming as king to rule. So I, I think that they may be fearful because of that kind of thing. Also, it might even be because they do, maybe they are followers of Jesus in the sense that they're, some of them are believing in Christ. But again, they're expecting the Messiah to be a military leader. They don't see the need for the cross and his sacrifice yet. They don't get it. They don't understand Isaiah 53. They don't understand Psalm 22. So they see a military leader. So that would also anticipate a sense of fear. Here he is. He's going to, to you know, if there's any time where there's, you know, the, the city is ripe for rebellion and violence, it's at Passover because all the Jews are there. So mob rule can actually take over. So this may have been all the kinds of things that would cause fear. It's then that Jesus decides to just go completely sideways. And he doesn't say anything about taking over. He doesn't say anything about ruling, um, uh, kicking out the Romans or destroying them. Instead, he says, behold, we're going up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes. And they will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit on him and scourge him and kill him. And three days later, he will rise again. 
Jesus predicts several specific things. Mock, spit, scourge, kill. So four things that are going to happen. There may be Old Testament connections to these things. So mocking and spitting, we read about in Isaiah. I'm going to give you three passages in the Old Testament, by the way. And they're all messianic. And they all connect to what Jesus just said. So very subtle connections, but they seem to be there. Uh, Isaiah 50 verse, verses 1 through 12, I think. It, no, 1 through 7. Ah, 4 through 9. Isaiah 50 verses 4 through 9. This is the servant song, the, the third of the four servant songs of Isaiah. Then we have Isaiah 53 and 50, the end of 52, and that's the last servant song. And these are very much messianic passages, very heavily, heavy laden with messianic teaching in them. And we have Psalm 22, which Jesus himself quotes on the cross. Three very messianic passages, and they all seem to connect to what Jesus has said here. We're going up to Jerusalem, the son of man, right? He's going to be uh, mocked, spit on, scourged, and killed. Well, mocking and spitting on, we see that, and I'm going to give you some verses. Isaiah 50, verse 6, and Isaiah 53, verse 3. Also, Psalm 20, 22, verse 7, all three of those messianic passages. The scourging, we read about in Isaiah 50, verse 6, and Isaiah 53, verse 5. The death, we re read about in Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22. All these things seem to be connecting to these passages. Um, so altogether, we have two, two of the major servant songs, which are beautiful to look at the progression of how they how they start talking about Israel and then they move to talking about one person within Israel who finally takes the sin and suffering and pain and death that belongs to Israel. Those are beautiful. Uh, check it out. Google the four servant songs of Isaiah and you can see that progression through the four songs. But we're going to read right now one of them um, and that's Isaiah 50 verses 4 through 9 because it's an, it's an underappreciated servant song. <laughs> and so we're going to dig into it. Isaiah 53 you guys probably are well familiar with. Isaiah 50, verses 4 through 9. The Lord has given me the tongue of disciples, that I may know how to sustain the weary one with a word. So it begins by saying he's, he's teaching. God has given him things to teach and to share, and it will help others. And of course, that's ultimately true in Christ as he preaches the gospel and proclaims forgiveness. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen as a disciple. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not disobedient, nor did I turn back. I gave my back to those who strike me and my cheeks to those who pluck out the beard. I did not fear, cover my face from humiliation and spitting. Now, in the context of Isaiah, Isaiah considers himself not to be this perfect, obedient person. In Isaiah, the beginning of Isaiah, he's like, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips amongst a people of unclean lips. But no, here's this servant who's, who's not like that. He's perfect. He gives his back to those who strike him. He gives his cheeks to those who pluck out his beard. He doesn't cover his face from hum humiliation and spitting. For the Lord God helps me, therefore I am not disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like flint. Interestingly, Luke, when, it, when he talks about Jesus' final ascent to Jerusalem, he uses that phrase, set his face like flint to Jerusalem. And I know that I will not be ashamed. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up to each other. Who has a case against me? Let him draw near to me. Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who is he who condemns me? Behold, they will all wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them. And so this is, um, ultimately, we have this beautiful passage. Jesus is, it's as though Isaiah 50, this third of the servant songs, is written from the perspective of Jesus marching to Jerusalem. And then Isaiah 53, the final servant song, it's like it's written from him being on the cross, right? It's like a reflection of Jesus, the attitude they have while he's on the cross. It, it, um, it's powerful and it's beautiful. Now, there have been, let me move on to another point here. Uh, there's been a lot of talk, especially recently over the past several years, about who killed Jesus. Now, in the past, the talk went like this. Um, a lot of people wanted to say the Jews killed Jesus and so the Jews are guilty. And that it turned into like this anti-Semitism that would, and they'd use Bible verses to support it. Because you could use Bible verses to support whatever you want. But they would say, yeah, well, you know, like Peter in Acts 2, he says that the Jews killed Jesus with lawless hands. Um, but of course, that is incomplete <laughs> incomplete as most um heretical content is they can always quote a verse but they can't quote the whole counsel of what scripture says peter after saying that after admitting that yeah the jews had the jews and gentiles had a hand in it obviously but there were jews who were there who had killed jesus with lawless hands then in verse 37 in the same chapter in the same book they're they're freaking out what do we do peter what are we going to do we're, we're we've killed the messiah and peter's not like oh well you're cursed 
your people are cursed forever and it's too late for you. Instead, Peter, who is a Jew, preaching to the Jews with a bunch of other Jews who are all saved behind him because they were all Jews at the time. All the Christians were Jews. Peter says to them, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. God wants to bring salvation and comfort to them, even those who were directly guilty for the killing of Jesus Christ. So anyway, the, the anti-Semitism stuff, like if, if that's you, I, I, I don't know what I'm supposed to say to get you to slow down. Because already you're like stopping the video, unsubscribed, I can't believe you. And I'm like, I don't care. But I don't know how to slow you down enough to get you to realize that what you think is biblical is the opposite of the cross. Think about it. The cross is God reconciling the world to himself. And you look at the cross and you think it is the curse of God upon the Jews. It's God saying, no more, you're now cut off because you crucified Messiah. Instead, in scripture, the cross is God opening his arms to the world, even those who would raise their fists to him and saying, I love you, I died for you, I'm redeeming you, just come to me. What do you do now? You just come to me. And you'd be forgiven and you'd be washed and clean. And so to, to, to turn the cross into like an anti-Semitism is antithetical to the message of the gospel. And on no reading of scripture does it make any sense. Um, all right. But that was the old school stuff. That was the old school, you know, anti-Semitism of, of who killed Jesus kind of stuff. Now we have the new school uh, and it's not so much who killed Jesus as who didn't kill Jesus. And these are guys, progressive, progressive Christians, if you can call them Christians. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. And they want to sometimes take away the heart of the cross. And one of the ways they do that is by changing the meaning of the cross. And one of the ways they do that is by saying, God didn't kill Jesus. We did. God had nothing to do with it. And this is stuff that's popularized by guys like Brian Zond, who I've dealt with in the past as well. Nothing personal against him, but he's preaching rank heresy of the worst kind. And so as much as he's presented like a wonderful man, I just don't care. Um, I don't accept people's false teachings because they're very likable and nice. And I, I mean, I'm not calling him the guy Satan, but I'm saying Satan's method is that he disguises his ministers as angels of light. So we can't judge based upon how nice people look uh, as far as what their theology is. We need to, we need to stick to Jesus. So, in the passage I just read in uh, Mark, the passage we're in today, I'll take you guys there again, there is an indication about who delivered Jesus, or rather maybe who didn't. And so Jesus says in Mark 10, 33, that the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and scribes. And there's been a lot of ink spilled as far as like, well, who's delivering the Son of Man? Is it Judas? Is it the chief priests? Is it, is it the Jews? Is it the Gentiles? Who's the one initially delivering the Son of Man over? And the answer is going to be God here, right? It, it's uh, in all of the statements here, there's no indication that he's talking about Judas. It's just a passive sense. The Son of Man will be delivered. It's just going to happen. It's just part of the plan of God that the Son of Man is going to be delivered. That That's a consistent with the idea that God is the one who set in place, set in motion, planned out, and then ensured took place the crucifixion of Jesus Christ because it was God's offering for us. Now, some would find that offensive, and I think that your offense is the problem, not the doctrine or the teaching of Scripture on this topic. So the chief priests and scribes, they're the ones he was delivered to. They didn't do it. It's not the crowds. They're not even there when Jesus is taken. Crowds aren't there. It's not Judas, because Judas is a betrayer, not a deliverer. Now, ironically, there's one translation, I'm trying to remember which one, that actually translates this word delivered as betrayed. The Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests. But... So there's, you could get into a long discussion on it, but basically the same word delivered here is what we have for hand him over to the Gentiles. So this is a deliverance. It's not a betrayal. You should you translate the same word in the same context in the same way, generally speaking. So he should be, he is, it should be translated delivered, not betrayed. Is it doesn't seem to be referring to Judas. Judas betrayed him, but he didn't deliver. He didn't deliver Jesus at all. He betrayed him. It should be the wrong verb. So who's the one who betrayed him? Well, the scripture seems to make this pretty clear. Um, in Isaiah 53, we read that it was the will of the Lord to crush him. We read that God makes his soul an offering for sin. It was God's will and God, the, God's the one who made his soul an offering for sin. Jesus seemed to teach this too. All three times in Mark, when he announces his death, it's with this 
opening phrase about there just being like this passive event that must take place. In fact, it even uses the term, the Son of Man must be delivered. It has to happen. He even says it has to happen because the scripture will be fulfilled. So it's not just a blind act of man. It's an act of God ultimately using men, even their rebellion for his good because God's sovereign. So he can even use your wickedness to accomplish his ends. In Acts 2.23, I like how Peter puts it. This man, Jesus, delivered over, and who does Peter think delivered Jesus? Delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. You nailed him to the cross. He, he, he tells him, yeah, you killed him, but it was ultimately in God's plan. It was God who, by his plan and his foreknowledge, is the one that delivered Jesus. Why do I think this matters? I think that Jesus' com- Jesus's death is not just a commentary about pacifism. And this is what Brian Zahn and some others will do. They reduce the gospel. I know they speak the, about the gospel in very lofty terms, but they're, it, it starts to sound like great swelling words of emptiness to me. Jesus' death is not just a commentary against the violence of man, nor is it teaching us Christian pacifism. His death, while there is some element there that speaks about violence and about the bloodthirst of man, there's elements that are there that are very true. But his death is a sacrifice that is like a ritual sacrifice where he dies in our place, representing us paying for our sin that we might be forgiven. This is a central aspect of the gospel of Christ, a central aspect of the cross, and we should not miss it. That's why it matters that God delivered him over because he's the one giving the offering. Like in Genesis 22, when Abraham says, God will provide for himself an offering. God provided the offering. I think that's pretty significant. All right, now let's get back to the disciples. Um, the disciples, sometimes we think they're knuckleheads. And, and I granted, because they are, right? Like we, we laugh at them even. And I found myself doing this, especially, especially in my younger days when I wasn't so old as I am now being 95. Um, when, when I first was really reading the word and coming to an awareness of the history of Israel, or I'd be reading the gospels and I'd see the blunder sometimes of the apostles, I, I just couldn't help but in my in my zeal and self-pride, I couldn't help but think, I would never have done all that, right? Like, I would have definitely been better than them. And so we sometimes laugh at the apostles and their mistakes. Like, for instance, them not getting Jesus. He clearly says, I'm going to die and rise, and they, and they don't receive it. But there is a parallel that we are just as dumb as any disciple ever was. And we do it all the time in our lives. And it's not about the cross. And the reason is because you, unlike the disciples, you're after the death and the resurrection. You're not seeing it happen piece by piece. You, it's all happened. You've seen the end of the story. You've seen the glory of the resurrection. And so now you look back and go, ha, what fools. How could they, how could they doubt? How could they not see it? But your own suffering is very much like the disciples on the cross, where they see it and they don't get it. And I think this is when it hits us because our own suffering, my suffering right now, whether it's physical pain because of medical issues, because of persecution or because of the loss of loved ones or even, even just other trauma that happens in life, life is traumatic. And there's times where you get overwhelmed with stuff that you don't even have the words to explain how much it hurts or how it feels. Stuff that if someone told you you would go through it, you never knew it would be that bad. You know, this, this has been me with like every doctor visit I've had, right? Like it's, they say, oh, it's going to, it's going to pinch. You'll feel a little pressure. And for some reason, it's always like way worse than they ever predict. Oh, your recovery should be quick. And it's like, no, that wasn't quick or easy. And it, they always sort of underestimate like the harm <laughs> that the healing causes. And in, in the, in the same sense, if I was to describe to you the trials that you would face in your life, you never would have realized how much they would hurt. Most likely I wouldn't, they just we overestimate our own ability to endure suffering. And then we get in the middle of it and we're like, this is worse than I thought. How am I going to make it through this? And that's when we're just like the disciples and we see the cross and we ignore the resurrection. And this is where I want to give you a pastoral insight that I hope is an encouragement to your heart. Our suffering is often a surprise to us, just like the cross was a surprise to the disciples, but it shouldn't be a surprise because just like the cross was predicted and the resurrection, so our suffering is predicted, and so is our resurrection. But just like the disciples, when we're, when we're in the middle of suffering, we forget the resurrection. And when they saw the cross, they forgot the resurrection. 
we're the same way. In the middle of my pain and suffering, I forget about the glory that's to come. And then this cripples you in dealing with the suffering you're going through right now, whatever it is. So let me give you a few points about our suffering, uh, three big points about our suffering. And this isn't just like a cute three-point sermon. Like these are biblical truths that we need to get into our hearts and minds. Suffering, number one, is to be expected. Just like the cross was expected, just like Jesus was fulfilling scripture, they should have known this was coming, he told them. Your suffering, it's been predicted, like in numerous ways. First off, you're told to take up your cross and follow Jesus. A cross is a suffering type thing um, of the highest degree. It was like, there was no example Jesus could have picked in the first century that was a greater illustration of suffering than the cross. There just wasn't one. It was called the extreme penalty, like the ultimate penalty by the people back in the time. You're also told that persecution is something you're going to endure. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.12, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So you'll suffer persecution. And I think that in, in the season that's coming our way in our world, that that persecution is going to increase. And this isn't to make us paranoid or make us think that everything's persecution when it's not. But yeah, it's probably increasing. And we need to set our face like flint. Be ready to face it. It's coming. But then there's another aspect of our suffering, and that is groanings. And for this, I want to give you a scripture because I, I think I think some of the prosperity preaching that we've heard has really damaged our ability to understand this. And then it messes us up, creates false expectations. But in Romans 8, I won't read through the whole thing, but in Romans 8, uh, Paul talks about how creation is groaning. It's going through groanings. And so... Um, the, uh, it's, it's in slavery to corruption, creation itself. And what he seems to be talking about in Romans 8 is things like tornadoes and um, hurricanes and, and animal suffering and animal pain and forest fires and those kinds of things, earthquakes, this sort of stuff that's like the suffering of creation where the world's beautiful but things aren't right. Things aren't quite right. Then, so, so this is not things like where you sin and you deserve this. It's just stuff that happens that's part of the overall plan of God's redemption. He allows this temporary time of pain and suffering. Then he says this. After creation groans and suffers, he says not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves. This is a powerful and profound idea, and I hope I can help it sink in. When you have pain that is beyond words, you can only groan. When you don't know how to express how you're feeling, you can only groan. Paul is saying that you, yeah, you, even Christians, even spirit-filled Christians, you will have groanings that are a result of just living in a fallen world that are very hard to go through, and you will just groan. Now, he then goes on to say that we have the Holy Spirit who helps us, right, that we can, we can, we can pray as you read on, I'm just scanning through it with my own eyes here. But as you read on, you can see that the Spirit intercedes with groanings. That is my very painful, too much for words I'm going through. And I just groan to the Lord. He hears me. He understands. He's there for me. But here's my point. This suffering is to be expected. Persecution, suffering because you have to die to yourself. You have to give up things as you're following Jesus Christ. You take that strict path of discipleship, true discipleship in Christ. As well as just groanings because the world hurts. That's expected. First important lesson. Second, second point on suffering is that suffering is for our character. Your suffering that you're going through right now, the suffering you'll experience next year, five years, 10 years from now, things that you, you, you didn't have words for, you don't even know how to explain, you never could have anticipated it. That suffering is for your character. James, I, I got to read these verses to you. James chapter one, verses two through four. And maybe you're thinking, I know, Mike, I know this. No, you, you can't just know it as you nod your head and wash, you, you wave it away. you got to know it when it comes into your heart and brings you comfort. That's how you have to know it. James 1, verse 2. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Endurance or patience. You're learning to endure. This is causing character growth in you. And let endurance have its perfect result or mature result so that you may be perfect or mature and complete lacking in nothing so the the goal that god is bringing out of my pain and suffering is my character growth that is he's not making you more wealthy he's not making you better looking 
He's not making you more capable of doing things in this world. He's changing your actual character. Now, if I can offer a cheesy illustration, which I will, I will do with or without your permission. Um, I, uh, I, I, I've always enjoyed video games. I, I don't enjoy them as as you get older. Like I just don't enjoy them as much. But I still like sometimes will play video games just to, you know, have a good time, relax, and uh, <laughs> probably not as often as I should actually. <laughs> At any rate. The games that I tend to like are the games where I have a character in the game and you can like level up the character. Whereas games where it's more about the gear and you get better gear, I just don't find those as interesting. For some reason, the idea that the um, the leveling up is attached to the gear instead of the character is just less appealing to me. I don't know why this is. Maybe, maybe you're the same way. But thinking that the character themselves is growing stronger is somehow satisfying to me. Well, when I go through suffering, it is not giving me better gear in this life. I'm not getting rich. I'm not getting stronger physically. I'm not getting whatever, even stronger mentally in many cases. I am, however, getting more godly character. And that character growth is permanent. That character growth is eternal. I'm going to take this, the, the growth even brought through pain. And I'm going to carry that with me into eternity, into heaven. And that is worth it. It doesn't feel like it, perhaps but I believe it's absolutely worth it. And that's why you should count it all joy. Another verse that gives us this is 1 Peter 1, verses 6 and 7. In this you greatly rejoice. That's talking about our, we're rejoicing in our future glory and in the salvation we've received. Even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. And here's the so that. Peter's telling you what your trials are for. Please let this sink in your heart. The, so that the proof of your faith, being much more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tes tested by fire, may be found to, to, excuse me, I keep stumbling, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That is, there's going to be this character growth and that your faith and your trust in God that shines when you go through hard times. That will be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Wow. It's worth it. It's for your character. And finally, I'll give you one last thing. Final point on suffering, and we've got to get our head wrapped around this, because otherwise we're like the disciples who, when they saw the cross, didn't see the resurrection, and they despaired. You see your suffering, and you don't see the glory that's coming, and you will despair. In light, here's the third point, in light of the glory that is coming our way, the certain and guaranteed glory that is coming the way of every true believer in Christ, our suffering is nothing. And for this, we have an incredible passage in, in uh, 2 Corinthians. Incredible passage. This is, I don't know if you've ever seen how powerful this is, what the incredible contrast is that he's trying to give us. But if we can, if we can let it hit our minds, it might hit our hearts as well. So, in 2 Corinthians, Paul gives us his account of like how they go through all kinds of suffering. And um, he says they're afflicted, they're perplexed, they're persecuted, they're struck down. And then this crazy one, they're always being given over to death. How extreme is that? What if those terms described your life? Afflicted, perplexed, meaning you don't really understand what's going on. Even the apostle, sometimes he went through suffering and was like, I don't really understand what God's doing. Right? He's perplexed. Right? But he's not in despair. He hasn't given up, but he acknowledges he doesn't know what's going on. So he's afflicted, perplexed, persecuted, struck down, always being given over to death. Does that describe you? This is like the worst kind of thing you could have happening in your life. You have physical affliction. You have confusion about the things going on in your life. You have persecution coming from people outside you. You are being struck down, though not destroyed, sure, but you're being struck down. You feel beat down and you're actually going to die. You're being given over to death. Okay, after saying all that, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. This is why you've, you've got to see how bad things were for Paul to catch what he says next. Therefore, we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying. Does that describe you? Your outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. We have spiritual renewal even while we suffer. Then he says something even more extreme. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. 
Let me remind you now, and here's, here's, here's where you've got to, it's just got to hit you. What Paul describes as momentary and light affliction is afflicted, perplexed, persecuted, struck down, and always being given over to death. They are caring about the dying of the body of Jesus. This is, this is worst case scenario. And to him, it's momentary, it's temporary, and it's light affliction. Was it actually light affliction? Absolutely not. Why does he call it light affliction? Because he compares the lightness of that to the weight of the glory that is coming. And even the suffering I'm going through is part of my path to eternity and glory and joy. And by comparison, and here's the key, all the troubles and overwhelming groanings that you go through, when you compare that to the glory that's to come, it's light by comparison. It could weigh a ton, but this weighs a billion tons. It just doesn't compare. And this to me is an incredible Christian hope that the suffering I'm going through now has no comparison, no matter how bad it is, to the glory that's coming. Let me give you an example of, of what I mean by this. Let's say that you, I put you in a slingshot and we'll pretend that you're a kid so that you're not scared and you think you can't die. Um, so I put you in a slingshot, a giant slingshot. And suffering is like being pulled back in the slingshot. And glory is like when you get released. And so as you're pulled back in the slingshot further and further, that like represents your life as suffering. You're getting pulled down further and further. You feel the tension. You feel the hardship. You feel the pain. But you know something in the slingshot. You know the further back you get pulled, the higher up you are going to soar when this thing gets let go. That is what we should think about with our suffering. As bad as this is, I know that if what's coming far outweighs it in glory, then as bad as this is, what's coming must be amazing. The comfort that's on its way must be so grand. I, I, I can't imagine being comforted through the things I'm going through now, but how amazing must the glory be if it's incomparable to this? Th this is a huge and important point that we need to get our heads wrapped around. Raise your expectations for the glory that's coming. As much as you suffer, realize there's like an inverted image from suffering to glory, except it's times a thousand or a million or whatever. It's just way more. I believe one day we will appreciate our suffering. Just like the disciples, they, they were in despair when they saw Jesus on the cross. And not too long after, they were rejoicing in the cross because of the resurrection. Me, when I am with you in heaven, we're going to be able to look back at our suffering in this life. And I can't do it now. I admit that I'm perplexed like Paul. I don't understand it right now. But there's a day where I'll look back and I'll say, Lord, I rejoice even in the suffering because I see what it brought about in eternal life. I see the glory that came even out of those hard things and those bad things. And just knowing that that's coming means that I could, I could try to practice my my uh, my pride, my, my prideful thought that I wouldn't be like the disciples by examining my life and saying, am I like the disciples right now? Seeing the cross, but not the resurrection. Seeing my suffering, but not the glory that's to come. I think that's the bottom line. All right, you guys, this has been the, uh, the, the end of the study. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for you and uh, I hope that you'll join with me in having a very sincere, uh, very sincere prayer about our attitude towards not just the cross of Christ, which we have in perfect perspective now, but through the difficulties that you're suffering. Father God, we pray for wisdom. Lord, you, you say that if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. Well, the context of that we know in James 1 is in trials. So maybe we're perplexed, not, not sure how this is working out. We just pray for the wisdom, Lord, at least to see that the glory that's coming far outweighs far outweighs this. This is light and momentary affliction by comparison. And we pray, Lord, for people, for us to be people of hope, people of confidence, for us to lean into the fact that our suffering and our trials is producing patience and character and growth and transformation, that goods are coming out of the, out of the bads that we are experiencing. May we be able to count it all joy. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Thank you so much for joining. Um, uh, as far as schedule goes, I don't know when the next live stream will be. I'm probably going to do it next Monday. We'll do the next installment of the Mark series, probably on Monday. Uh, uh, and I'm not promising this, but most likely it'll be like middle of the day, like 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. That's most likely going to be the time. I wasn't able to do it this week on Monday, so I, I stuck it on the old Tuesday live stream time. And I have heard you guys uh, on my video, last video, 
or I asked if you guys wanted more Q&As and it, I feel like there's been a pretty positive response. So I'll probably do another Q&A video coming up um, within a week uh, and hopefully be able to be a blessing to you guys. So thank you very much. Take care.